Let's go on a journey through digital photography of the 1990s with five iconic, groundbreaking, always weird, and sometimes pretty rare cameras. And as I soon found out, getting these cameras to work today is a huge pain. It's playing music. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can get any good pictures today, starting with the oldest and going to the newest. Let's start in 1995 with Ricoh's very first digital camera. This is the Ricoh RDC-1, a technology-packed digital camera that would set you back $1,700 back in 1995. And that money would only buy you 0.4 megapixel photos, but that's not even the lowest resolution camera on my list today. It's a different shaped camera, as you may have noticed, pocketable like a Palm Pilot would have been back in the day. There's a zoom lens and even an optical viewfinder along with a flash. You'll notice there is no LCD screen and that's because it's a separate module that you would clip onto the side of the camera like this. You could use it flat or you could twist the screen for different viewing angles. And then when you don't wanna lug that around, you can leave it out altogether and just use the camera without it. The camera uses proprietary batteries that aren't made anymore. They charge in the camera using a power cable and at least one of the connectable accessories like the LCD screen. For memory, the RDC-1 uses a Type 1 PC card. Mine came with the official Ricoh branded card with 8 megabytes of storage and a weird shark eating a fish logo. <laughs> so that I could use these older cameras, I picked up this beautiful older IBM ThinkPad laptop, which just so happens to have two PC card slots right there on the side. That shark is my nemesis. I spent hours trying to get the photos off of this card to no avail. So cameras one, James zero for now. I did get this to work on later cameras you'll see. The lens is a 51 millimeter to 153 millimeter equivalent three times zoom lens. And if that 51 millimeters isn't wide enough for you, because it's not very wide, there was an optional wide angle attachment that you could add to the lens. Because there's no way to screw it onto the front of the lens, the lens adapter would actually screw via the tripod mount at the bottom and then flip up. This adapter has a 0.7 times effect, making it around a 35 millimeter equivalent. Not exactly wide angle, but much wider angle than 51 millimeters. And as an interesting note, Ricoh has stuck to the compact cameras as really being their thing even to this day. And most models, especially the professional ones, all come with wider angle adapters still. So just interesting it started all with their very first digital camera. And while Ricoh made film cameras, they're not nearly as recognizable as this next brand. In 1996, one of the greatest electronic games of all time was released, the Bop It. And that helps explain the look of this digital camera released in the same year, which is a mix between the Bop It and the Star Trek Enterprise. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. This is the Polaroid PDC 2000, a one megapixel camera where the design wasn't at all the only unique feature. For starters, it uses an internal 40 megabyte hard drive, which was a lot of memory for the time and pretty expensive. You can hear it start spinning when you turn the camera on or take a shot. And this camera was expensive. It would have set you back $4,000 back in 1996, or $5,000 if you wanted the upgraded 60 megabyte version. That's over twice the price of the Ricoh we just talked about, and adjusted for inflation is about $8,000 of camera in today's money. This wasn't for kids or hobby photographers. This was for a serious photographer. And what do serious photographers want most in their camera? Manual controls and the ability to change lenses. And you can actually do both of these things, sort of. The lens is removable, and Polaroid sold two at the time. The kit lens that came with the camera was this 11mm f2.8 lens, which equates to a 38mm field of view when compared with a 35mm camera. But then they also made this, a 17mm f2.8 lens, which sold for an extra $200, and it gives you a 60mm equivalent field of view. And let me tell you, it wasn't easy finding one. There's a lot of interesting things about these lenses. If you look at the back of the lenses, they actually spring back and forth. And when you look closely, that springing motion is actually moving glass elements in the lens. This helps the camera focus, but it's only part of the focusing system. Internally, the camera sensor itself is on a rail of sorts, which moves between 60 different positions to help achieve focus. That's right, the sensor is moving, not just the lens. And if you look inside, there's actually the other half of the lens back here with a rear element affixed in the camera. And it can be removed just like elements from a lens can with a spanner wrench. 
What's also interesting about this focusing system is this bizarre radar looking thing over in the corner. This is not just for show, it's actually a sonar. You know, like sending out ultrasonic waves and recording the response, a real sonar. This and the following model are the only digital cameras I'm aware of that use sonar to autofocus. And while this is incredibly strange, it actually makes sense. In the 1970s, Polaroid pioneered sonar autofocus with their instant cameras. So this is the heritage of that living in digital cameras. Focusing with sonar actually has some advantages even today. The main one being that it can focus perfectly in the dark because it's not reliant on light, it's just sound. One of the major downsides of focusing with sonar is that you can't focus through things like glass. Sonar bounces right off of that. Actually getting the photos off this camera to a computer is this highly sophisticated song and dance number. And not only now can I get the photos off of the camera, I can also remotely control it in the tethering mode, which is what professionals would have used to take things like headshots in a studio with this camera, which I can just imagine <laughs> this little guy sitting on a tripod taking your corporate headshot or school photo. And maybe that convenience is what justified the $4,000 price tag, but this next camera is way more affordable. I distinctly remember the holiday season where every other kid in my neighborhood got a Game Boy Color and I didn't. Who's laughing now? <laughs> in 1998, Nintendo released along with the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Camera, and it was an immediate hit. The original MSRP was only $49 and compare that to the thousands of dollars of the other digital cameras we have been talking about, and you can see the appeal already. But that cheap cost came with some compromises. The Game Boy camera was only 0.014 megapixels and black and white only. Despite this, the camera went on to be one of the best-selling digital cameras of the 90s. And how you use it is it fits into the Game Boy just like a game cartridge. The camera itself on the top is rotatable 180 degrees, so you could take selfies. There's the original selfie. And the camera modules came in a variety of colors, just like the Game Boy itself. So you could really accessorize your Game Boy. And if that wasn't quirky looking enough, using the camera is actually gamified in itself. When it starts up, you're presented with music, a game menu, and even some games to play while you take pictures. In some ways, this is the first example of a social camera like smartphones are today. The images you take are really meant to be shared with somebody else either through tethering to another Game Boy camera or through printing. And printing was an option. Here's the official Game Boy printer, which you can print your photos on thermal paper, like receipt paper. Isn't it beautiful? Can you even see what it is? <laughs> Back in 1998, you couldn't get the photos off of this onto a computer. But nowadays you can, thanks to some clever enthusiasts who have reverse engineered the printer signal to pretend that our computer is a printer. It's pretty easy to set up. You just follow guides and buy some equipment or DIY it yourself. And if you get it to work, you're left with something truly iconic and insanely fun to use. Perhaps the only other digital camera of the 1990s to rival the success of the Game Boy camera was Apple's first digital cameras, the Quick Take series. Now, I don't have the original Apple Quick Take 100, but I do have the next best thing, the Apple Quick Take 150, which was the following model. The Apple Quick Take isn't so much an Apple product as it is a Kodak. Sure, Apple made the design of the camera, but the internal gets are all just Kodak. These cameras are only 0.3 megapixels, so even less than the Ricoh, which came long before it except that these only retailed for $700. The design of these cameras is really interesting because you end up using them like a camcorder. That is, you hold them sideways in your hand like this and sort of hold them up like a monocular or something. The Apple Quick Take series also came with a wide angle adapter like the Ricoh, and it just clips onto the front here for a much wider field of view. Unfortunately, the Quick Take 100 and 150 both use one megabyte of internal storage that can only be accessed through a special serial cable, and I have not gotten this thing to work. But given that my Kodak DC50 is essentially the same camera internally, and it uses a PC card slot that I can use a CF card in my adapter for, I can show you what the images would look like. Using the camera is pretty frustrating because it has some shutter delay, 
But you can imagine at the time, the excitement of having a family digital camera that was much cheaper than those really expensive cameras, but high resolution and less of a toy than the Game Boy camera. However, what came next from Sony really took digital photography convenience to the next level. Back in 1999, Sony sought to solve a problem that existed in virtually every digital camera up to that point, and that was memory. You've already seen what a mess it is for me to get these photos off these cameras today because they all use different memory types. And that's what was even worse in the 90s. There was no standardization yet. So Sony solved this problem by using a memory format that was standard, everyone already had, was cheap, and just worked with their computers without an adapter. That's these little guys, floppy disks. Starting in 1999, Sony released their brand new digital Mavica line with four new cameras. The beginner model was this FD73, which you could grab for only $5.99. It has this unique square body design, which fits the profile of a floppy disk quite perfectly. <laughs> and it can record images up to 1.3 megapixels in size. They're really just video stills, but the quality is decent. Also, you may be wondering how many images a single floppy disk can hold. Well, they can hold 20 to 40, depending on the level of quality you save the files to. Amazingly, the batteries for these are still being produced and can be had easily. And USB floppy drives are also cheap and easy to come by. I'm even able to connect this floppy drive to my Android phone and it shows up as a removable drive for quick image sharing to Instagram, which is about the only place where these images look halfway decent. At the top of the Mavica line in 1999 was this FD91, which went for $1,099 and it had more of a DSLR professional style body. It is also the same 1.3 megapixels, but you get 14 times zoom lens and even image stabilization. Also, you'll be surprised to learn that both of these cameras can shoot video. Hello, this is me just recording a video on this camera. albeit short video clips until the floppy drive runs out of memory. These cameras actually had a big impact on quick turnaround projects like photojournalism. And while relatively short-lived before memory became cheaper and more standard and that problem was solved, these cameras still remain an iconic set of 90s technology. I hope you enjoyed learning about these cameras. Subscribe if you want more old digital camera content. And as always, happy snapping.